With the help of Ben Franklin, Thomas Paine immigrated from England to the Americas just in time to uh, participate in the Revolutionary War. There had already been some battles between the, the British and the colonists before Paine arrived, but most people at that time were not thinking about a war for independence. They were just wanting better treatment from the British crown. So Thomas Paine's face is not on Mount Rushmore. He wasn't invited to sign the Declaration of Independence. But I don't think it's a stretch to say that neither one would exist if Thomas Paine hadn't come to America and begun to share his philosophical and political thinking with the rest of the colonies. He started out writing letters to the editor of various Philadelphia newspapers. You gotta respect that. <laughs> Don't enjoy it too much. But get this, the letters got to be too long to be published. And so he started writing pamphlets, which prior to uh, Payne starting to write pamphlets, people hadn't really taken them seriously, but his were sold in the streets and then they were read aloud in taverns. And, and ultimately, Thomas Paine's thinking about democracy uh, became a part of the conversation of the colonies. Now, I have to tell you, in his day, the word democracy was looked on about as askance as the word socialism is today. But it was Thomas Paine's arguments against monarchy and in favor of democracy that literally put the language of democracy into common conversation in the colonies. So his brief work, Common Sense, the pamphlet that described democracy, actually helped to win the ideological war that led uh, colonists to be willing to engage in the Revolutionary War. So I think it's, it's fair to say that one of the real uh, thinking fathers of our nation was Thomas Paine, even though in public schools he's almost never mentioned. The common history of the founding of America was written in a way to give almost all of the credit to rich white men. And it really wasn't that way. People like Thomas Paine and even Ben Franklin were never given an opportunity to be president. It was only rich white men that were pulled into that level of public service. Still, our American Revolution was a bold and fairly radical thing, and it was talked about the world over, largely due to the insights of people like Thomas Paine. Our revolution sent shockwaves around the world and made monarchs everywhere nervous. But the, the enthusiasm for the American concepts of freedom and independence and democracy stirred the thinking of people in France more than anywhere else. That's where the gift of the Statue of Liberty uh, came from. The French really took hold. So just more than a decade after our Revolutionary War, France took them at their word and led to a religious revolution in France. Now, Thomas Paine uh, wrote Age of Reason, um, his second famous pamphlet, in response to the French Revolution because Thomas Paine was afraid they might take it too far. He thought, uh, he said in Age of Reason that he knew that once people embraced democracy and independence as a political idea, that religion would come next, and he was a little bit concerned that the French might go too far. Where Paine's uh, common sense had painstakingly described why the emperor had no clothes, Voltaire, even earlier in France, had very graphically described why the pope has no clothes. Paine opined that he had known that this was coming, but he wanted people to be reasonable and balanced about it. He was initially right that 
uh, a religious revolution was going to follow a political revolution. And in fact, when our Constitution was signed, only about 7% of uh, people living in the colonies actually had any affiliation with organized religion. Thomas Jefferson had said uh, that within his lifetime that every man alive in uh, the colonies would die a member of the Unitarian Church. He, he thought organized religion as it had been known at that time was going to pass out entirely and it looked like it was going to. It faded away in France, it faded away in the Americas. We had a revival that led to certain European revivals. We've had at least three periods of great American revivalist moods that regrew the populations of churches. Now, it hasn't happened in France. France increasingly became secular and more or less stayed that way. Great Britain, much the same. If people go to church at all in Great Britain, other than very small uh, progressive groups that I get invited to speak to. I, I think the largest group I spoke to this last trip I took to Great Britain was only about 50 or 60 people. There's just very small churches. So if there's a big church, it's sort of like our Six Flags Over Jesus. It's, it's, uh, it's almost always a far right-wing group. But in the latter part of the 18th century, it was common for Thomas Paine's pamphlets to be read in toto in public places like taverns. And if we had the time, I would love to stand up here and read all of the Age of Reason to you, but I learned a lesson on Easter when we read <laughs> all of, uh, all of uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, that there is a certain limit to the amount of time you all are willing to spend in church, and that certain limit is about 50 minutes. So I'm going to read just a section of his first chapter of Age of Reason. And, and just to clue you in, when he wrote this, the Ottoman Empire included almost everything that we think of as the Middle East. So when people of that era refer to Turks, they are referring to Islam and all of the Arab nations uh, in the world. So he writes, I believe in one God and no more, and I hope for happiness beyond this life. I believe in the equality of all people, and I believe that religious duties consist in doing justice loving mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. But lest it should be supposed that I believe in many other things in addition to these, I shall in the progress of this work declare the things I do not believe and my reasons for not believing them. I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor any church that I know of. My mind is my own church. All nations, institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions set up to terrify and enslave humankind and monopolize power and profit. I don't mean by this declaration to condemn those who believe otherwise. They have the same right to their belief as I have to mine. But it is necessary to the happiness of man that he be mentally faithful to himself. Infidelity does not consist in believing or disbelieving. It consists in professing to believe what you do not believe. It is impossible to calculate the moral mischief, if I may so express it, that mental lying has produced in society. When a man has so far corrupted and prostituted the chastity of his mind as to subscribe his professional belief to things he does not believe, he has prepared himself for the commission of every other crime. He takes up the trade of a priest for sake of gain and in order to qualify himself for that trade, he begins with perjury. Can we conceive of anything more destructive to the morality of humankind than this? Now, it always amazes me that such plain spoken truth was available in print hundreds of years ago. 
And yet it seems most of us who were reared in the church were put through the same kind of brainwashing that Voltaire and Thomas Paine so seriously and articulately decried. Paine feared that the French, once they took all the property from the church and dismissed all of the priests, that they might go too far and abandon morality entirely. Isn't that what we've suspected the French of all along? <laughs> It's a curious affect of the mind that religious people uh, have that without fear of hell or hope of heaven, that we might all turn into the human equivalent of a pack of dogs that would either sexually ravish uh, or eat or pee on whatever we find. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Voltaire pointed out that Socrates, Cicero, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus all had morality, even though they did not have Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. In Voltaire's rather pointed way, he writes in his dictionary, this is a great dictionary, by the way, it's quite witty, not like Webster's at all. He defines morality this way. <clears throat> Excuse me babblers, preachers, extravagant controversialists, endeavor to remember that your master, Jesus, never announced that the sacrament was the visible sign of an invisible thing. He was nowhere admitted four cardinal virtues and three divine ones. He has never decided whether his mother came into the world maculate or immaculate. Cease, therefore, to repeat things which never entered into his mind. He has said, in conformity with the truth as ancient as the world itself, love God and your neighbor. Abide by that precept, you miserable cavaliers. <laughs> Preach morality and nothing more. Now, by the way, a cavalier in Voltaire's parlance meant someone who was flippant, and it carried with it the implication uh, of being a man who had affairs with married women. Now, how that became the name of a basketball team, you're going to have to find that <laughs> somewhere else. I don't get the connection there at all. Still, more than 200 years ago, in both the newly independent United States and in the much more ancient nation of France, published thinkers were calling out the fake facade of creedal religions and insisting that spiritual people focus on morality rather than beliefs. What we hear often talk about the primacy of orthopraxy over orthodoxy, how you live rather than what you say that you believe in. I find it especially revealing that Thomas Paine could say that for a priest to become a priest, he or she must begin by committing perjury. That is, in order to be ordained, a priest or a pastor in almost every denomination other than Unitarians and humanists has to stand up for an examination either in front of a presbytery or a, a group of elders or in, in my heritage, in the Christian church, it had to be in front of an entire congregation. A few years ago, I was, uh, you know, we have these rebel groups that listen to our videos uh, hiding in basement Sunday school classes. They don't go to their church service. They get together and, and subversively watch one of our videos and discuss it. But... Uh, <laughs> one of those well-placed groups within a Presbyterian church that was searching for a new pastor, uh, they got my name in and they contacted me to see if I might consider coming to their community to be their pastor. And the guy who was charged with uh, calling me very sheepishly added, or, or you, you'd have to be ordained Presbyterian. And, and I said, before this conversation goes any farther, I want you to go and read the ordination vows, the examination to become a Presbyterian pastor and see if in any drug-induced wild imagination you could see me saying those things. He promised that he would take a look at it and I never heard from them again. You, 
you stand me up in front of a congregation and start to ask me, do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the inspired word of God and salvation is possible only in Jesus Christ? And I will answer those questions, but my answers would probably knock the mortar out from between the bricks at a Presbyterian or Methodist or Episcopal or Baptist or Disciple Church. Before we started our little progressive church here, I had applied to teach preaching in a religious college in New York. And the president of the college was quite enthusiastic. He contacted me, but again, with some trepidation, he faxed me a, a copy of the pledge that all professors had to sign to teach at King's College. And it was the same thing. Uh, a very wealthy man had set up the college with a large donation, but with that donation, he insisted that everyone that taught there sign a pledge that they believed that the Old and New Testaments were the inerrant word of God and that salvation was possible only in Jesus Christ. So I said to the guy, I said, you can't seriously expect uh, a real scholar to sign that statement. And he said, if you won't, I could get 50 other people to sign it before I leave the office today. I would rather sell used cars than to sell my conscience. <laughs> because you know, everyone who's ever stood for ordination had to go through that once. There was a time in my life when I was young enough and impressionable enough that I was willing to say those things in public. But I guarantee you, it'll never happen again. I did hear of one brave Presbyterian. I'm not picking on Presbyterians. This could be Methodists or Episcopals or anyone else. But the process in, in the Presbyterian church is you sit before a presbytery, a board of other clergy, and they are allowed to examine you. They've got a whole book of ordination. You went through this, didn't you, Mark, with it? They can ask you any question that they want to from a list of a couple of hundred questions. And there was this one crotchety old preacher. You can imagine that that could be true. Um, <laughs> that just didn't like this young man that was coming before them. And so he, he had just been giving him a grilling. And at some point, he pulls down his glasses and says, young man, are you willing to be damned for the salvation of the world? <clears throat> and he said, sir, at this point, I'm willing for this entire presbytery to be damned for the <laughs> salvation of the world. But folks, Voltaire and Paine, with no theological training at all, could look at every priest they had ever met 200 years ago and know with certainty that they had lied to get their job. <clears throat> they had lied and agreed to help perpetuate the myths that keep the public in fear of hell and willing to suffer unspeakable manipulation in the hope that they might get a better deal in eternity. Now, Payne rightly points out that if your career starts with a lie, if you start out by committing perjury, then your mind has already been bent to make you pliant to go along with every other social ill that comes through the institution. Still, Thomas Paine was right to fear a radical overreaction to revealing the fraudulent myths of religion. Religion, you can say, uh, was behind the Crusades, it was behind the Inquisition, it was behind countless battles between Protestants and Catholic factions, as well as at least a part of the slaughter of the indigenous peoples of South, Central, and North America. But in the absence of religion, there was the Holocaust, there were the Soviet and Chinese communist genocides, there was the Khmer Rouge. Millions of people have died at the extremes of both sides. There's the Crusades and there's the Khmer Rouge. The issue is not traditional religion or no religion at all. The real issue is that we need to have a healthy spirituality that helps us to learn how to be good people. If you are an ordained minister who thinks, as Mike Huckabee is, who thinks that it is Christian to take children from families that are fleeing violence and poverty and starvation in Central America, if you think that's Christian, 
then what that means is the Christian religion has failed to meaningfully survive into the 21st century. And it is destined to take its place alongside the worship of Zeus and Odin and Baal. There is no first church Baal in Springfield. You know, there is, there is a way in which Christianity can turn itself into a museum piece to remain historically curious, but morally irrelevant. In the Christian West, you can honestly say that capitalism has been used to impoverish and to enslave the masses in order to enrich a tiny minority. Amen. You can also say that in the largely atheistic East, communism has been used to impoverish and enslave the masses for the benefit of a tiny ruling minority. And we've all been asked in the East and the West to be willing to give our lives on the battlefield to defend one abusive system or the other. But always in all places, the masses have been enlisted to serve the interests of a tiny ruling minority. I just think we all ought to stop falling for that. I'm not going to anymore, and I hope you won't either. Voltaire and Paine called for an age of reason in which, to use Paine's words exactly, I believe that religious duties consist in doing justice, in loving mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the only creed we'll ever need. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.